Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is a meeting of the Northampton Board of Health. It's Thursday, January 13th, 2022. This meeting is being recorded. And do we have all our board members here? Is Lauren here? Yes. Um, present tonight are all of our board members, including Dr. Suzanne Smith, Dr. Cynthia Swopis, Dr. Lauren Levy, and myself, Dr. Joanne Levin. We also have our esteemed director of the Northampton Department of Health, Meredith O'Leary, and our staff, Kelly and Amy. Um, this meeting is a continuation of the Board of Health meeting held originally held on December 28th, when we did hear three hours of public comment. All who raised their hands to speak at that meeting were heard. I will take the liberty to speak on behalf of all of our board members when I say that we are truly interested in the comments and opinions of all those who live, work, or study in Northampton. Your comments are frequently informative and we often learn new perspectives on the issues which may and should influence our deliberations. However, hate speech is never welcome here. Uh, the Department of Health um, and our board members have also received hundreds of pages of emails which were distributed to all of the members of the Board of Health. I want the public to know that I, and I suspect the others here, have read every single one of them. The public is always welcome to write us at any time through the, witty web, through the city website on the Northampton Department of Health webpage. The agenda, date, and time of all Board of Health meetings meetings are posted on the city website at least 48 hours prior to a meeting, but often earlier than that, in the agendas and minutes section. City councilors often alert their wards of upcoming meetings, and the date of the next meeting is usually discussed near the end of a meeting, so there is nothing done in secret. And lastly, while I know that the idea of vaccination requirements for certain businesses is a topic near and dear to the hearts of many people, it was on the agenda last time and again now as a discussion item. The board has not even yet begin, begun its discussion of this topic. There is no motion on the table. And so tonight we will begin our discussion. Um, the other thing to know is I guess there was some confusion about the agenda. The agenda listed for tonight was not exactly the same as the agenda listed for December 28th, even though this is supposed to be a continuation of that meeting. So we will not discuss any new business tonight because this is a continuation of that agenda. Um, and so um, we will tonight have uh, a review um, by Vivian Franklin, our nurse um, of the data. And then we will talk about the agenda item that's listed as discussion of vaccine requirement and efficacy of vaccination. Um, so from there, take it away, Vivian. Um, Joanne, Dr. Yes, Levin, can we open the meeting yes, and have a motion? That's okay. <laughs> Thank you, uh, well said. Motion to open the meeting. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Lauren? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Okay. Our Board of Health <laughs> is officially open at 5.35 p.m. Okay. Now, Vivian. <laughs> Hi. Thank uh, you. I'm going to start sharing my screen, and hopefully that goes as planned. All right, can you all see my screen with the presentation slide? Yes, we yes. can. Perfect, okay. Um, as you may all know from my frequent updates, I try to update the public weekly on our data and then I also post it to our website. Um, it's been quite an intense couple of weeks here. Um, so just since January 1st, we've had 23% of our total confirmed uh, cases to date have occurred since January 1st. Um, and that's in keeping with trends that we're seeing, you know, across the nation, across the state. Um, so I don't know that is, you know, surprising, but it's still, you know, alarming. 
So um, in the past 14 days since we last met on December 28th, we've had 788 new cases reported to us, um, 743 confirmed cases, meaning they had PCR tests. Um, this data does not include home tests. Those are not reported to the state. Um, so we know that this is a, likely an undercount. Um, on average, we are seeing 56 cases per day um, over the last two weeks, and our highest was 108 new positive tests in one day on January 3rd. Um, so our 14-day incidence rate is now up to 200 cases per day per 100,000 people, and the state's reporting our positivity rate here in Northampton is 8.3%. Um, and that is only done out of our molecular tests. It does not include antigen tests, whether they be home test or proctored. Um, in the past seven days, um, we've had 511 new cases. So the bulk of our past two week data that I just reported on did occur in the past week. Um, our average in the past week was 73 cases per day and the seven day incidence rate is 260 cases per day per 100,000 people. Do you have any questions about this slide? Um, would you just tell me the total number of cases since the beginning of the pandemic in Northampton? So it's 23, that would be 23% of... So confirmed cases is what I report on. Oh, 2,800, okay. Yeah, I report on our confirmed cases since um, probable cases do include um, antibody tests, that were done at the beginning of 2020, as well as um, antigen tests, which are sometimes overruled by negative PCR tests. So I'm only including our con PCR confirmed test results in that total confirmed case count. Okay, thank you. And that's 2,856 total cases for those of you who are on your phones. So the, the, the population of Northampton is about 28,000, so that's 10%. I, assuming it's one individual per case, okay. Yep, and that assumption is often true. I will say we have had um, reinfections. I don't have exact data on that. I'd have to really you know, comb through my reports to um, really identify reinfections, but I know that the reinfections are being looked at by state epidemiology as well as the CDC. Okay, so hospitalizations, this is kind of a hard graph to read. I understand that, so I'll explain it. Um, I just wanted to show hospitalizations um, compared with cumulative cases. Um, we've kind of seen hospitalizations mirror um, case rises previously. Um, I will say we have had hospitalizations rising um, in the past month since our cases really started to soar upward. Um, but they have not been going up, um, you know, at the same degree, you know, as they were with mirroring cases in previous surges, which is reassuring. Um, I think we have maybe a 1.4% hospitalization rate in the last month for new cases. Um, but the, the, you know, the problem is that we have so many new cases that as a function of that, we're going to see a rise in hospitalizations. Um, not to mention that our local hospitals do serve more than just Northampton, so that should be considered as well. Um, this data does not include ER visits, um, which are also a burden on our hospitals. They don't include primary care visits and they don't include urgent care visits. They're just inpatient hospitalizations with COVID-19. Can I just clarify uh, something that I think is true, but looks funny on these graphs? Yeah. On the graph on the left, it looks like hospitalizations are higher than cases, but they're using different um, y-axis, right? The yes. hospitalization uses the axis on the left, and the cases use the axis on the left, on the right. right. So one is not really higher than the other. You're just Correct. looking at the shapes of the graphs. And the same is true for the graph on the right. There are different numbers on the left and the right, and we're really focusing on the shapes of the graph and how they track each other yes. as opposed to the which one's higher. Yes, um, and I, I do want to be transparent about that. I don't want to come across as disingenuous in any way. Um, hospitalizations, that's correct. So hospitalizations are on the left side column. We've had almost a to total of 140 hospitalizations. I will say hospitalization data can be underreported too. Um, it relies on some degree on um, 
uh, individual reporting for cases from their medical records um, that could come from us talking directly to infection control, talking directly to patients, um, or from, I think, teleform reporting directly from the hospital. Um, there is a chance of underreporting with that. Um, but yes, on the y-axis, which is on the left, that's our hospitalizations, and that corresponds with the orange line on that left side and then um, with the blue line on the right side. So I have two questions. Yes. Uh, first question, is it fair to say, if you look at April 2020, right, uh, on the left graph, you see an orange line with a slope that's far steeper than the gray line, right? Yeah. Whereas in contrast, when you go to current times to the right, you see a steeper gray line than an orange one. And the interpretation would be, there were more hospitalization per case uh, per in, in last year in April 2020 that there is now. So there's two factors there. Um, there were certainly more hospitalizations per case. We didn't have as um, good of you know outpatient treatments available. Um, so more people ended up being hospitalized. But another major factor to consider is that it was very hard to get testing at that time. You really had to be kind of hospitalized or at a point where you were almost hospitalized or um, at risk for hospitalization to even get a test. So there was a huge undercount of cases at that time in 2020. Okay. And then second question. Um, so COVID-19 hospitalization, um, Am I to understand this is someone who comes and says, I have COVID and I feel really bad and I need to be hospitalized? Or is it someone who shows up because, I don't know, they had a heart attack and in the process of checking on them, they will do a COVID test and find out they're positive. Is it both of those cases? Both could happen. Um, more often, it's going to be somebody who's hospitalized with complications of COVID-19 who I included in this data. Um, so this is data that I, you know, and my, my team collect um, from COVID cases. Um, sometimes if they're in the hospital for something other than COVID, I don't mark them as hospitalized for COVID because that, I mean, it, for my purposes, it, it, they're not hospitalized for COVID. Yeah. Um, so you know, there's a lot of media attention about that. Yeah. And I'll say from my experience at Cooley, uh, we're not seeing a lot of you are seeing occasional patients being admitted with COVID rather than because of COVID, but most of our patients are admitted because of COVID. Yeah. So the, the reason I'm asking this is because of the, the New York governor suggesting that it was half and half. I don't think we're seeing that, but I, okay. haven't, I haven't looked at that data just from my just quick view of our cases. I don't think we're seeing that kind of number. Okay. Any it's other questions about happen. this slide? Sorry? Any other questions about this slide? Okay, Go I'll move on. So like I said, um, while it's reassuring that, you know, that slope is not as steep as our rising cases, um, I, the problem is that our local hospitals are also serving other communities. Um, and in addition to that, COVID patients tend to have long hospital stays, so they are taking up beds. So um, with that in mind, I do want to look at Cooley Dickinson's hospital data, and I think Dr. Levin here um, is going to have some more insight to share with us about what is going on over at Cooley. Yeah, so you can see these are our different surges at different times, and our, this is our census of uh, COVID-positive patients. And they are all in private rooms and they take a lot of time to take care of because people put on their PPE and, and all that. Um, so our, the peak in our previous surges was 21 and our peak uh, recently is, has been 25. Um, and again, um, the hospital is not functioning as normal. We've cut down a lot on um, uh, elective procedures and surgeries. And um, some of the staff from the procedural areas are helping out in the ICU and in other floors. Um, we have a lot of, uh, our, our beds are totally full and we have people being held and sort of um, on paper being admitted, but not actually having a bed. And we have an overflow area in, in our procedural area. So uh, things are not functioning as normal and in their ideal manner, um, but they're functioning. Any questions about that? 
Oh, oh just this is as of January second, twenty six in. Um, is it still? No, that's the, the peak there. But actually, the last number is one six. These these uh, this data is put out like once a week. So. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. So we we but you don't have a sense for what it was one week later. Are we are we have have we increased from twenty six to thirty, or twenty six was really the max, or you don't uh, know? 20, 25 was the maximum that I've heard of. And um, so we had 25 and then it went down for a few days. And since the 6th of January, I think it's gone back up to 25. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. So it's and not jo decreasing yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. And jo Joanne, my understanding is that um, staff is taking a big hit from COVID and also from uh, the, the great resignation. So do we have a percent of um, employees that are down at, at uh, Cooley Dickinson? No, I don't know that. I know we... I've had many employees uh, either out because they have COVID or because they're out. Um, we don't keep our employees out with an exposure. Um, but before, if they have a household exposure, they do need to be tested before they come back because that's a high risk exposure. Um, but I, I don't know that number. And they're operating under the five day rule too. Is that correct? That is not correct. Uh, healthcare is different and they're not operating on the five day rule. Okay. Thank you. You're talking about how long they need to be out with COVID? Yes. Yeah, so we have a new return to work policy, which is just new since Omicron and since the CDC rules. Um, and the CDC rules are different in healthcare. They're not the same as the um, public, um, but we are in, um, you know, there are different levels, different rules for um, how much of a crisis mode you're in. We're in one step up. We're in, I think it's called contingency mode. Um, and the next one up would be crisis mode. So we're not considered there. Um, but the CDC standard for healthcare is, um, I think, a seven days out. Uh, but because we're in contingency mode, staff need to be out five days. And what we're doing, because we're part of Mass General Brigham's system, is we're doing what they are doing, which is our, our system is actually sending our employees an antigen test kit and they can test somewhere between day six and day 10. If they test positive, they have to stay out till 10 days. Um, and so if they test negative, they are allowed to come back between day six and day 10. Any other questions about um, hospital? Thank you, Vivian, do you have any more? I have Bay State as well. Um, this is from their press releases that they've been releasing on um, inpatient census. And I did want to look at that um, since they are a level one trauma center for the whole Western Mass. Um, as of yesterday, they were reporting 307 inpatients, 34 of whom are in critical care. And that's across their different um, campuses. Bay State Medical Center in Springfield had 245 inpatients. Bay State Wing had 23. Bay State Franklin had 13. Bay State Noble has 26. Um, and this is you know, still very relevant to Northampton as many individuals require um, hospital level care for you know, COVID-19 as well as other conditions at Bay State. Um, and you can clearly see if you just look back so, um, just, you know, to the to December 24th, just the sharp increase in hospitalizations over the last you know, half a month. Any questions about that slide? I don't have, we don't have as much you know, insight into what's going on over at Bay State, at least as, as far as I know, um, as we do with Cooley Dickinson, since we don't have a Dr. Levin there. Um, can we, or Dr. Levin for, for Cooley Dickinson comment on out of those cases, the ratio of vaccinated, unvaccinated, or we don't have that data. That data is not available in the press release. I, what I can say more anecdotally, um, and I emphasize anecdotally from um, people who are hospitalized um, with the vaccination um, is they oftentimes have only had the primary series and have not, you know, had a booster vaccination, and that that's been my experience, or, or they have not had um, a vaccination at all, or, um, 
you know, often tragically, there's cases where they had one of the vaccines and they caught COVID right between um, getting the two doses. Um, so what we are seeing really reassuring data with the, the booster vaccinations in terms of its effect on severity of illness. I'll agree with Vivian on that, just for my quick perusal of some patients. Um, it's rare to see patients who have high booster doses being admitted to the hospital. And that's, that's consistent with what's, you know, really being shown in research is, um, you know, uh, waning immunity or, or um, you know, really waning immunity from, you know, if you just had the primary series and that's why, you know, we're, we have the booster vaccine to be up to date now. Would you, would you comment on um, the age of people that are hospitalized? I know I there's a range, but if there's a trend that you can describe. Um, I mean, age is certainly a, a, a risk predictor as are, you know, if you have underlying health conditions. Um, so there is variability and I would say there's more variability than in age um, than there is in the presence of underlying health conditions. Um, and I say that, you know, not, not taking it lightly that, you know, people with underlying health conditions are still people. <laughs> Um, and you know they shouldn't be getting sick and getting hospitalized. I don't have any information about that. I haven't really looked at that. That is data that we collect when we um, investigate hospitalizations as if you know they have underlying health conditions. Okay. Oh, I think this is it. We're done. Yeah. I had, I had more stuff, but I'll, maybe I can share it next week. Thank you so much, Vivian. Thank you, Viv. All right. Um, oh, one second. Um, all right. Um, so the only other topic we're going to discuss tonight is a continuation or the beginning of our discussion of vaccine requirement. Um, and efficacy of vaccine. And I thought um, I would open this discussion by talking about the science of SARS-CoV-2 transmission as I understand it, because I think it's important that we're all on the same page. Um, and I wanna make sure we're all sort of in agreement with the science. Um, I'd like to clarify that when people talk about vaccine protection and efficacy of vaccines. The words um, efficacy of vaccines uh, from infection, meaning means a positive test is very different from efficacy of vaccines or vaccine protection from severe infection and death. So when we talk about effectiveness or efficacy of vaccines, I think we really need to be very clear what we're talking about. Um, and I'll say from my point of view, we have uh, really a good data on the original strain of uh, COVID, of SARS-CoV-2. We have good data on the Delta strain and we have very little data because it is so new uh, about Omicron. Um, so the history and of transmissibility, as I understand it, um, is that with the original strain of SARS-CoV-2, we learned that our vaccines were extremely effective at preventing severe disease and death. And vaccines significantly decreased shedding and transmission of disease at that time when vaccines were first instituted. So at that time, in my mind, a vaccine requirement for public, this is my opinion at this point, um, the vaccine requirement for public spaces where people would remove their masks or breathe heavily made sense because vaccination decreased transmission. Okay, back to the science. In the summer uh, of 2021, we learned we had a new variant, which was Delta. And we learned that protection by our primary series was not as good as it originally had been. <coughs> of infection and transmission and actually the CDC wrote up the experience of disease transmission in Provincetown from that July. And when they looked at the folks who had COVID and compared the ones who had vaccination 
and the uh, ones who didn't, they had the same viral load, the same amount of virus in their nose. And this was new, this was different from what had happened with the earlier strain. And this was unexpected. Um, and this was all documented in the CDC. Um, Booster doses at that time definitely improved things. And it was shown that during the Delta surge, those who were boosted were le five times less likely to get and spread COVID than is a positive test compared to those who were not vaccinated. And those who were vaccinated were not as infectious for as long a time. Unfortunately, recently in December, while we were still in a Delta surge, along came Omicron, and it has the highest transmission rate of any SARS-CoV-2 we have seen before. It appears to be more resistant to our vaccine-induced immunity. While it is considered relatively less severe compared to other variants, it is still sending record numbers of patients to the hospital with complications of COVID. The surge is only about one month old, and so there's a lot that we do not yet know about it. From my own observations, I see that there are a lot of breakthrough cases and we do not yet have good data to know if vaccination or boosters protect significantly from infection or transmission. But we do know that vaccination, especially with boosting, which is now called being up to date on vaccination, um, continues to protect from severe disease and death. And we see that in our hospitalizations as well. Um, so I'd like to um, do a little slideshow. I'm just gonna um, see if I can figure out how to do this. Um, one second. I move some things around. Um, I see on the bottom of your screen, a green tab. Yeah, it was covered by my, oh, how do I know which one? You, you'll have multiple screens up there. Pick the one that your uh, your presentation is. The pictures aren't coming up. Uh, oh, share, does that work? <clears throat> Minimize your Zoom screen and just open up on your desktop the presentation and then maybe you'll have a picture of it. Oh my goodness. If you want to send the presentation to Lauren, he can he can share his screen. Did we lose Joanne? Oh yes. I think oh. I think she's gone. She must have oh. um, hit leave meeting by mistake as she's trying to figure it out. Okay. I still see her. Oh, you do? Oh, we don't hear her. Oh, I see a message that says she's- There we go. Now I'm back. I'm sorry. This is not <laughs> working out well. I'm going to try one more time. Um, I apologize for this, but I couldn't see which screen to open. I'm going to try one more time. Share screen. And the pictures of the screens are not coming up. Why? Joanne, do you just want to email it to Lauren? Sure. And then he can share his screen. Okay. Okay. Um, I will do that. Um, so let me, uh, I'll just finish. Um, so what I wanted to show uh, was the efficacy of vaccines um, as our state DPH has shown the data and also data from the CDC, how vaccines and especially boosters protected um, against um, severe disease and death. 
Um, but admittedly, all this data and even the most up-to-date data that's on CDC is from October, which was when we had a Delta surge. Um, um, and I'll just, I'll stop there and uh, Lauren, I'll email that to you. Um, Uh, would anybody else like to make a comment? Um, I, I would. Okay. Okay. Um, I think some of the things I'm going to say are going to echo what you said, Joanne. Um, as far as the, ma the vaccine mandate is concerned, the rationale for this is that limiting space only to those who are fully vaccinated would reduce or eliminate transmission. And then the customers and staff could assume that they're at a lower risk of being infected. Um, and I think a mandate like this would be worth the effort if checking the vaccine status would screen out those who could spread COVID. And unfortunately, the evidence to support this is lacking. Um, as Joanne said, COVID vaccines are very good at reducing the risk for hospitalization and death, but this explosion of breakthrough cases in the, those fully vaccinated demonstrates what we have known, the vaccines are less effective for reducing transmission, especially of the Omicron variant. And many of the breakthrough cases are asymptomatic or not yet beginning to have symptoms. So a vaccine mandate would screen out uninfected, unvaccinated persons, but it would not screen out asymptomatic infectious persons who are vaccinated. So the intervention wouldn't, wouldn't do what was intended. Um, and responsibility for enforcing this, like the existing mask mandate would fall to the employees of businesses that continue to be among those who are most severely battered by the pandemic. And the health department, as we all know, does not have the resources to help. Masking indoors is already required, but appropriate masking is confusing and can be uncomfortable, especially while eating, drinking, or exercising. So masks often end up being used incorrectly in those spaces. Um, based on my experience picking up takeout, the masks come off as soon as the patrons are seated and they stay off. Employees are trying to enforce masking. And I understand how difficult this is. Every day, I have to spend time reminding those in my office about appropriate masking. It's tiresome and it becomes contentious. And I am not depending on tips from my patients for my livelihood, like the restaurant folks are. Everyone is exhausted and quite cranky after two years of COVID. And this Omicron surge to me feels particularly offensive. Um, and we all wanna do whatever we can to get through this and get back to some sense of normalcy. Uh, and mandating vaccine indoors may seem to make common sense. It's something that can be done and doing something can bring a sense of relief, but will it help? Um, New York City's vaccine mandate for indoor entertainment, recreation, dining, and fitness establishments has been in effect since last August. Yet COVID hospitalizations in New York are up 234% in the past two weeks. And like here, those hospitalizations are largely driven by unvaccinated patients. To summarize my perspective, <laughs> I think requiring vaccinations to enter these specific establishments that, that we're talking about is unlikely to have the impact on reducing transmission that we would hope. It would be a further board burden on the battered sector of our eco economic base that's already struggling with mask regulations. And it is, the mandate is likely to give a false sense of security to those who are vaccinated if they don't realize that a sizable number of other vaccinated patrons can in fact be infected. And with that false sense of assurance, 
other prevention measures start to slip. So what can we do? We can focus on what we know works. We should continue to encourage vaccinations. They're very effective. If you're vaccinating, you're helping the healthcare system, the terribly overburdened healthcare system. And I, I would hope that some businesses would choose to require vaccines to enter their premises as an added safety measure. And we should give these businesses our support for their extra efforts. We should patronize them. If you support vaccine mandates, patronize those restaurants that are um, implementing them. And the mask should be kept on except when you're actually eating or drinking. You pull your mask down, take a bite or sip, then pull your mask up to chew. It's a lot, but that's what's required. And I think we should move forward assuming that anyone we encounter in any indoor space is potentially infectious. Even those who are fully vaccinated and asymptomatic. And we can continue our appropriate prevention strategies of masking, distancing, and disinfecting in every indoor space, not just bars, restaurants, and fitness and entertainment spaces. Um, I, I hope I had hoped the vaccine mandate would help, but at this point, I don't think the evidence is there to support it. Thank you. Um, would anyone else care to comment? I, I, I will, but I do. I can show you slide first if you'd like. Oh, sure. Thank you. All right. Let me share my screen. Ah, thank you. Can you can see? Make, can you make it a little bigger? Yep. Up. How's that? Great. So this is data from this, our state health department uh, comparing cases um, um, for unvaccinated, vaccinated, and boosted. Uh, again, this is only through December 4th, and that was before Omicron was present. Uh, but it certainly shows that the rate in unvaccinated way on the left in the light blue was significantly higher than those um, for the vaccinated in the dark blue in the middle. Um, and those who were boosted way down on the right in the yellow. Um, so vaccination during Delta did make a difference in case counts as well as, uh, well, we'll see, hospitalizations. Next slide, please. This again is data from this, our state um, comparing um, COVID rates in unvaccinated, what's what used to be called fully vaccinated and vaccinated with boosted in the yellow. Um, and um, again, this is in the Delta era um, that unvaccinated folks were five times more likely to get COVID and 31 times more likely than boosted folks to get COVID. Next slide, please. And uh, the state is keeping track of um, what we call breakthrough infections, infections, um, positive tests in people who have been vaccinated. Um, and um, the first two columns are, are counts. And the last column is uh, the percentage of all fully vaccinated. And I think when people talk about how many people in the hospital um, with COVID are vaccinated, the number looks high, right? Maybe half or whatever of the patients who are in the hospital have vaccine. And that makes you say, well, that vaccine doesn't make a difference. But the, um, that's a misleading statistic. And what you really wanna look at is the percent of fully vaccinated individuals um, who either get disease or are hospitalized over the total number of vaccinated individuals. And the state has that number, at least for its residents. Um, so you hear the percent of all fully vaccinated individuals who got COVID. Um, I think this is cumulative. Um, was, is 5.1%. Uh, I think this is, um, since vaccination began. So it's about a year's worth of data. And hospitalizations among fully vaccinated individuals is low at 0.09%. And death among cases of fully vaccinated individuals is quite low at 0.02%. Next slide, please. 
This is CDC data uh, that looks at uh, cases again by vaccination status and booster. And this is the latest data that they are showing on their website. And it, again, it is from the Delta time. Um, but again, uh, this is cases. Um, unvaccinated people had 10 times the risk of testing positive and 20 times the risk of dying from COVID. Next slide. So um, this graph shows the various studies that were done showing the effectiveness of vaccine uh, against Delta variant um, to prevent hospitalizations. And although they're not perfect, they're really very good. And, and this is even in the Delta era. Um, next slide. And this is the same um, data from the CDC, but this time is the graph of deaths. Um, and you can see, I'm not sure why that all the lines were going down at the end of October. I thought cases were going up, but anyway, unvaccinated is much higher. Um, than vaccinated um, as far as the risk of death. And that's all I have. Thank you so much, Lauren. So, but a, a quick question is really because the data stops in November, um, it's a reflection of the pass through Delta, as you've pointed out. And we're really looking at something very new. So we can only make some inference we, but we, we don't have the, the, we don't exactly know what those trends are um, until perhaps the whole thing is over and, and, and the number of cases starts to drop and we enter a calmer period. Um, my question I have perhaps is um, any word of another variant uh, profiling in the horizon? And I'll stop sharing. I'm not aware of a, what they call variant of concern uh, right now. But certainly this uh, Omicron variant has woken us all up to the possibility of ongoing new variants. Um, I think it's interesting that new variants that take hold, the reason they take hold and go through a population is because they're more transmissible. So Delta was more transmissible than the original version. Omicron is more transmissible than Delta. Um, so for another um, variant to take hold, it would need to be more transmissible. And I have to say, I think it, it just happens, we just happen to be lucky in a way that this variant is more transmissible, but seems to be less virulent, but it didn't have to be that way. And the next one could be more transmissible and more virulent, I'm sorry to say, and that's, the idea of that is so incredibly depressing, um, but I don't think we know. I, you know, is this are we, are, is this the end? Everybody, most people are going to get either infected or exposed and or vaccinated. And is this the way we get to sort of? It's not herd immunity, but but somewhere where everyone is protected enough that it stops surging in this manner, and we don't really really know. Um, I'd like to know is is the current setting aside going out of COVID and taking the flu, is the current flu, the variant of the flu that we have nowadays, a descendant of uh, the 18, 1918 flu? And can we use the same analogy that it was initially very virulent and progressively went down or is the, was the analogy totally false? Um, there are lots of different strains of flu and each year, different strains um, circulate. Um, and the only reason that we get a little bit of a heads up about what to include in our vaccines each year, they, the vaccines change each year uh, because different strains are circulating in the Southern hemisphere. So we watch and see what flu circulated there. And then we hurry up and try to get our vaccines together to take our best guess of what strains are gonna circulate here. Um, and we have had outbreaks, you know, of new, newer uh, H1N1 caused a big outbreak when it came. And I don't think that has anything to do with, you know, um, the 1918 flu. Um, 
Our problem is our flu vaccines are not as anywhere near as effective as our COVID vaccines. Um, and I think they're working on using this technology, the mRNA technology for flu vaccine to make them more effective. Um, but our flu vaccines are, are lacking, but they're best we have right now. There are a couple reasons for that. One is that they have to uh, choose the strains that are going in the vaccine so far in advance because until now, flu vaccines have been manufactured in eggs, an ancient technology that has not evolved in 60 years. And the reason it hadn't involved, uh, evolved is that manufacturers said, we don't have the resources to invest in a new platform. There's no money in it for us. And the vaccine legal scenario is so difficult for the manufacturers to negotiate that they just use the old technology. And so they choose it six months in advance based on variants elsewhere. And by the time it gets to us, it's mutated many times. And so the vaccines that we're using have a variable level of effectiveness against the particular strain when it reaches us. And even actually when there's a good, we call a mismatch or there's a match, even when there's a match, those vaccines are not as effective as we would like them to be. Right. Um, so, any other, yeah, go, go ahead, Lauren. No, no, I'm sorry. It's just uh, one, one more question is, could we, could we see a future where there's a, some sort of a combo flu COVID that we have to go to get each year? Um, I mean, if we want to in some way. Yes, I've, I've seen discussion of that. I think Moderna is already working on that. There's also work on a COVID vaccine that would target all the strains and um, not rely so much on the part, the spike protein that mutates a lot. Um, so there's work on that as well. But, you know, vaccines are really difficult. I'm a doctor, I take care of AIDS patients. There's still no AIDS vaccine. And this is, you know, 30 years, 50 years later. So. Um, it's vaccines are really difficult. Cynthia? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, just jumping off of, from some of um, thank you, Su Suzanne's comments. Um, the cities of New York, Boston, San Francisco, most recently Brookline, have decided to do a vaccine mandate. And so I'm, I'm making an assumption that they thought that this would make a difference. Um, and since we started this discussion on December 28th, which would have been given us pretty good lead time to do something like this to make a difference, um, I just have to, I have to ask the question, will it make a difference? Because uh, so much of our data and, and the statistics that we've been seeing tonight is that we know it'll make a difference it's vaccines, boosted vaccines will make a difference. We know that. But well, it depends what you're talking about. It will make a difference in hospitalizations and deaths, I believe. Yes, that. yes. Will mm -hmm. it make a difference in transmission? Transmission. Is, is yeah. what's the, re, re, the question that we don't have the information for, I think. And, um, and even though, I, I guess today, Boston tested its wastewater and they found out that they had significant decrease in COVID in the wastewater, does this tell us that it is waning? We don't know. I mean, I, I just have to keep going back to the question, what difference will it make? And will it make a difference? We don't know, and it's very difficult to tease that out. I mean, what proportion of the population at this point in time is going to restaurants and bars and fitness centers? It, it, it's certainly not the majority. Um, so if you're in, imposing these mandates on, on a small sector like that, what's the overall of, of impact in the population? Um, I don't know how they would measure that. Yeah. Um, um, I, you, you look at New York, Boston is recent. I think Brookline is recent. I, I don't have any familiarity with the San Francisco data. But when you look at the New York data, it mirrors the situation everywhere else. 
um, and and they've had they've had this mandate in place since <laughs> August. So just eyeballing it to me, it doesn't look like it's having a significant effect. And it's a, it's quite a burden to place on on the establishments. And additionally, say, we don't. Oh, sorry, ahead. Dr. Levin. Go ahead. We don't have the data like we did a year ago when we were doing the contact tracing, being able to identify where the transmission was happening. Um, Vivian can speak to this way better than I can, but there is no data showing that it, the transmission is is happening in the bars or the restaurants. Um, so before, you know, we always make our policies that are data-driven, evidence-based, and that kind of is what moves our needle. Yeah. And I would hate for us to make a policy that would have such a huge negative unintended consequence um, <clears throat> without this, this data point, very important data point. We see a lot of our transmission happening within households and, you know, you know between friends and families and gatherings. So I think that's really, really important. And, <clears throat> you know, just from the small data sets that I see, you know, the breakthrough cases prove, are, are, are proving that the vaccine is not stopping transmission. The vaccine is working in the sense, as Dr. Levin said, to reduce infection and severe illness, but it's not reducing transmission. I think those are two important points that we need to think about when we pass a policy. And I'll have mm -hmm. to say, I've done a lot of investigation in the last week or two. I've spoken with uh, a deputy of the Boston Public Health Commission, <laughs> sort of inquiring about their um, train of thought in doing their mandate. And you have to realize, even though their mandate went into effect in December, they've been probably working on this for months, right? When we we're in the middle of a Delta surge. Um, and so they said that they chose the restaurants, bars, and, and gyms and venues um, based on places that were high transmission, but were not essential services. Um, you know, New York, when they put theirs in place, included grocery stores, and, you know, they just wanted to do it everywhere. Um, and um, so to me, I haven't really gotten a good answer back from anyone, like, does this make sense in the, in the era of Omicron? And I've not heard back any answer on that. I mean, we really don't have the data. I've also been in, in, um, in touch with the assistant commissioner of the mass DPH and asking about data on Omicron. And I've, I don't think I've seen any data from them. Um, they are continuing to push data as I showed you on the efficacy of uh, vaccine and particularly on boosters um, for severe disease and death and for hospitalization. But I, I, I have not seen uh, data on reducing transmission um, and cases, you know, and, and, and disease. As, uh, as, what, mm -hmm. as was predicted, um, this rise occurred after the holidays. Everyone said the holidays are going to be very important for, and, you know, like, <laughs> right on time, Omicron explodes. So that reinforces what Meredith was saying, it's it's close contacts, friends, family, kids bringing it home from school, um, not not restaurants, bars and venues. Yeah, I think unfortunately we had the perfect storm of having Omicron descend upon us right before the holidays and yep. um, it's wreaking havoc. Yeah. Um, any other comments? So oh. this was a discussion item. I just want to point out this was a discussion item. There is no motion on the table unless someone wanted to make a motion. Um, and if we feel like we've discussed it enough, we need not go further. Um, sort of up to you. I, I, I wanted to add a few comments, but I don't know if uh, um, Cynthia, Cynthia, were you? did you have further comments? Because I don't know if you had wrapped up um, what you had to say. I, I do have a, um, a couple comments, but go ahead. So they, they, there were two topics I wanted to discuss um, uh, and, and beyond what, what you say, which I completely agree with what was said previously, but there are two things I wanted to discuss. One is a feedback on the comments that we received um, to tell you what I thought, and perhaps you can share your experience, but also so that the public knows. And second, 
um, I took the initiative to talk to the folks at The Roost and at The Dirty Truth, and I just wanted to relay their experience. Great, thank you. Um, so Cynthia, I can go ahead, or otherwise, if you if you have something else, it's, it's up to you. Uh, I, I'll, I'll wait till after you, Lauren. That's okay, great. perfect. So on, on the comments, um, I can tell you, I've, I've read through all of the comments, except the comments that I received today, uh, the seven pages that we got today, um, which I didn't read. Um, first, um, speaking of the public comment that we got, um, um, on the first portion of this meeting, uh, there were 77 comments, as far as I can tell, based on my count. Uh, as you remember, um, I think there were all of them but one, the first one that we're relating to this mandate. And uh, by and large, it was overwhelmingly against um, the idea of a vaccine mandate. Uh, it was very passionate, as you recall. Um, and I read through approximately the three, 300 pages of comment. And the, as far as I can tell, we had comments from uh, business owners, um, some of business that I know and have patronized in the past, a number of business employees, um, some residents and visitors um, to uh, Northampton, uh, and some uh, comments I would say, I'm not even sure that uh, they've ever been to Northampton before, uh, just based on the pattern of, of comments. Um, at the onset, at, towards the end of December, it seemed that a lot of people were generally against the idea of a mandate, but still I started to see as time went on, a lot more comments of people in favor of, of such a, a mandate. Um, many of the arguments uh, were the same. I'm gonna quote my favorite comment, which was a comment that was against, it was a two-liner and it was, vaccine mandate won't work, you should all resign in disgrace. So that went, that went fast, that made me laugh, even though it was uh, not, not very pleasant. But a lot, some, some comments were far longer, more, more elaborate. Um, what I saw, that obviously a lot of threats of boycott, if you pass a mandate, I will no longer patronize or do business in your cities. But there were also a lot of folks, and I wanna relay that, Many comments that I've read were people who said, I am not going to a restaurant. I haven't gone to a restaurant since 2020 because people do not have a mandate, a requirement for a mandate. So I think there is a large proportion of the population that wants that. And I am not suggesting that we mandate a vaccine, but I want businesses to think about an opportunity and perhaps we can give at the city level uh, an incentive to do that, uh, whether it's a financial incentive or something else. Um, but I think there are a number of businesses that would greatly benefit from imposing a mandate. I'm not saying all business can do it, but I think a few can do it. Which takes me to my next topic, which is the experience of the roost and their dirty truth. I went to the roost the way the roost operates is you walk to the counter, uh, you order your food, uh, and if you wanna have your food um, to stay, to stay in, you have to show proof of vaccination. Otherwise you have to, you have to go uh, to take it, to, to, you have to have your food as takeout. And um, I talked to uh, the manager last Saturday uh, and um, it was a decision by the owner with their staff. They felt that it was a good decision, a good public health uh, decision. They did not consider business decision. They just thought it's the right thing to do. And they reported no incidents whatsoever. People were, based on the account of this manager, people were cooperative and understanding uh, when um, they didn't have the proof. I also talked to, um, Kyle um, at the Dirty Truth, and he relayed exactly the same thing, which is people were generally cooperative. Uh, he did not have any uh, incident uh, where things got out of control. Um, he also indicated that they have the benefit, the way they are set up, as you know, there's only one entrance. So again, it's not a one size fits all. Um, 
but they indicate they have a little advantages. There's always one person that is near the entrance, whether it's the person checking ideas on, 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 uh, on Saturday nights when it's busier or a person towards the front, the host. So they have a, an added advantage that they don't need extra staff to do that check. Um, the only thing that Cal mentioned was there was a bit of a backlash on social media, but that was just that, social media, not in person no angry mob um, taking over the dirty truth um, to, uh, to protest. So I, I think, you know, business owners should take that um, into consideration, uh, consider that they can tap into a large segment of the population that needs that reassurance, um, that need that extra precaution before they are willing to go out and patronize those businesses. Um, so I, I, and I think that's, that's an important thing. Um, I don't think I have anything else to have that I can remember, but if I do, I will say it later. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia? Yeah, thank you, Laurent, um, for that investigative anthropological report. That was great. Um, uh, and you, you reminded me of the fact that our initiative at the Senior Center, which is a vaccine mandate, came from the ground up. I mean, it, it really was through public comment. It was through a bunch of folks that, that uh, were members there that felt this would be a better senior center if we could do this and, and we listened to them. So I, um, I think that, um, that line of thinking is great. Um, the, the one thing I just wanted to bring up, I know we don't know, we never know what's gonna happen the next day, but Joanne, when you were talking about hospital goes into contingency, then crisis. And there's, there's these different metrics that make that happen. And if we somehow, after we're out of this, can get to understand what metrics would flip what switch, it allows the community to not be so surprised um, if, we, if we make a policy change that, that may be for a week or two weeks particularly if we gave the emergency powers to, to the health agent. So it's just something for us to, to think about. Um, unfortunately, now with, with Omicron, we, don't, we just don't have the data fast enough to make those, uh, make those um, um, future policies, let's say. So then I think that's- I, I don't know. Thank you, Cynthia. I don't know what the criteria are, and it's not yeah. clear to me there are really set criteria yeah. when the hospital is feeling stressed and needs to re, you know, rearrange how they do things. But I, I, I can investigate that if you'd like. Yeah. You have something but else? I'm, th I'm thinking about it as a community. What are, what are, are those criteria? Yeah. So, thank you. No, that's it. <clears throat> the, the extra thing that I had um, has come, I, I suddenly remember it again. And go ahead. So what, one thing that Kyle mentioned, uh, Kyle is the dirty truth was, you know, they came up with a protocol uh, using sort of essentially talking to folks in New York, see how things were going and see what they could do for their, to develop their own protocol. They wish in some way that there was some guidance from, from us, from the health department on how to do this um, and, and, and how to approach this. And I, 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 I also heard that comment from another business uh, in town that essentially said, we are in favor. Uh, we wish you could essentially take that upon yourself to put a mandate because you get to have the flag and we don't, as opposed to us doing it. And we don't really know how to do it. And we wish, we wish you could tell us how to get this done, how to enforce a mandate. And I, I feel for those businesses. I wish we could provide guidelines, but it's a little bit of a, it's tricky because no business is the same, uh, starting with if you have two entrances versus one, if you generally have food to go or, or if you like at the dirt truce, you tend to stay and so on and so forth. Um, I, I think, you know, the roost is a great model because it seems to be feasible for this type of establishments. Um, but that would not work elsewhere if you uh, say in a, in a pub and you want to have a beer to stay, right? Um, so all of this to say, and, and our experience at the senior center was that we're not gonna necessarily tell everything on how to do things at the senior center to check on vaccines because, well, we 
don't know exactly where the doors are. We don't know where it's a good location to check. So we can provide some guidelines, but we're also limited by, you know, the fact that we don't know the premises very well. We can only remain very, you know, general in our recommendations. So I that's, that's the a, only thing. I, I think that's a really good point. And I think at a future meeting, we might talk about what kind of guidelines we'd like to provide to our businesses uh, to be helpful to them. Uh, if they want to do this, there's a number of things that I think would be um, good things for the public, right? For public health, we know all that there's like five things that we think are good. And, uh, um, you know, mask, masking, uh, vaccinations, social distancing, um, ventilation is a big one of mine for indoor spaces. I think we don't haven't paid enough attention to ventilation and I, I'm not an expert, but I would like to talk about whether we can get a consultant using our ARPA money and, and, and help businesses improve their ventilation. So I think there's a lot we can do on the voluntary side for businesses and for guidance. Um, I also, interestingly, I spoke with Provincetown um, uh, Director of Health and they have a system um, where if a business wants to um, uh, mandate vaccination for their employees or um, say that only vaccinated people can come in, the Board of Health supports them by supporting them with a sign that has the shield of the uh, Department of Health, uh, but it doesn't exactly say that the Board of Health mandates it, but it's sort of fuzzy language, but it definitely <laughs> supports them with sort of blaming public health but yet it's a voluntary thing that the business is doing. So I think we can look in more detail at things like that, uh, where we can be helpful and supportive of our local businesses to do the right thing that we think are good public health maneuvers um, without a mandate. At this point, there's no way for those who would prefer um, a vaccine mandate to get into the premises, there's no way for them to know um other than word of mouth and i think signage could be used um as a marketing tool to to a portion of the population that i don't know anyone i mean it's just my n of one i don't know anyone who's gone to a restaurant in two years um people are just staying home or doing takeout um, well, Suzanne, and, we're, in, we're in a particular demographic, shall we say. I, no, I'm just, but I understand that. But what I'm saying there, I believe there's a sizable proportion of people who have not been um, patronizing restaurants, bars, venues, fitness centers because of this fear. And if they, if there was a way to know um, from the door that this is true, or uh, this may be a little tricky, but um, the Board of Health could have a list of the, of the establishments that are requiring mandates just as a piece of public information. I don't think that's showing any um, particular favoritism to one business versus another, but we can list which ones are enforcing certain public health measures. And if that were on our website, that would be a way for people to find out. So um, shall we put this on our agenda of guidance, um, public health guidance for businesses and we can sort of flesh that out a little more next time? Yes, I think that would be, that would be great. And, and perhaps um, researching a little bit what has been done in other, other cities, obviously um, would, would make sense. Um, so on this topic, um, of uh, vaccine requirements. Um, does anybody have anything else they would like to say? And I'm sorry, I see someone from the public raise their hands. I'm sorry, there's no, we're not having public comment. This is a Board of Health business meeting, um, but at our next meeting, there will be um, the opportunity for public comment. Um, anybody, mm -hmm. other board members? Yeah, Cynthia. Uh, just a, a, you know, timing. And, and I, we don't have another scheduled meeting for a month. So I'm just wondering what the thinking is around us. Um, anything can happen, as you know, with the virus any day. So I'm just wondering when yes. we will come to some uh, type of conclusion. 
Well, our regular scheduled meeting is on the 20th. It's always the third Thursday of each month. So okay. the board members are available next Thursday, same time, same back channel. I say we do it then. Is everyone okay with that, Lauren? Yes. Cynthia? Uh, yes. Uh, Suzanne? Yes. Okay. Um, Meredith? I'm available. You're on? I'm on. Okay, so our next uh, scheduled meeting will be next Thursday, the 20th of January at 5.30 <laughs> p.m. and there will be a public comment session. Um, so we'll create an agenda. I think one of our agenda items will be about the rules for public comment, but we will not get to that agenda item until after public comment. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, and uh, we'll get some more guidance um, from our attorneys about how to do that and from the mayor. Um, and um, we'll also bring up uh, guidance for businesses. I think we also had on our previous agendas, um, uh, we usually review the mandates that we have in place. Um, the senior center, I think we uh, dealt with last time, um, but our um, mask mandate, we always review. Um, and uh, if we're still in this surge next week, which I suspect we are, we could further discuss whether there's any short-term or immediate interventions that we can take. Um, so any, any other comments? Dr. Levin, I just wanna say first how proud I am of my board tonight. I mean, this was so super informative. You, you know, we stuck to the agenda item. We talked about the science or lack thereof. And I just am honored to be, um, yeah, your support staff for all of you. So thank you very much. I also at this time would, would like to ask each and every one of you to just give um, your background and what you do. I think it's very important knowing what, you're, um, what you do in a professional role to how you came to these, um, you know, to your, uh, to come to your discussion, your presentation tonight that, you know, I think that plays a big part and our general public doesn't know what any of you do in your professional capacity. So if you wouldn't mind just really quickly. Are you uh, board members willing to do that? Sure. Sure. Suzanne? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a physician. My previous life was um, in infectious diseases and public health and I spent 22 years at CDC. Um, I've done a number of things since then, and I'm currently the um, medical director of an addiction treatment center in Greenfield. Thank you. Cynthia? Uh, yes, I'm a retired faculty at UMass Amherst, um, but I still teach there online, and um, my discipline, my doctorate's in communication, my specialty is in health communication, uh, prior to that, I worked in hospital administration at Bay State Health. And uh, prior to that, I served as an officer in the United States Navy. Thank you. Lauren? Um, I am an environmental engineer by training. I work for a consulting company. Uh, I primarily work on groundwater pollution issues, including uh, all sorts of chemicals. You, you may have thought about uh, forever chemicals. That's one of them. And I specialize into um, chemical exposure in residential and commercial properties from the off-gassing of those chemicals uh, in a process of involuntary exposure. It's not, it's not unlike radon intrusion for those who know it, except it's by man-made chemicals. So I spend a lot of time doing risk assessments and at looking at data. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Joanne Levin. I, um, I'm an infectious disease consultant at Cooley Dickinson. I am the medical director of infection prevention, which also in some hospitals is called infection control at Cooley Dickinson. I have been there for about 33 years. I'm thinking of retiring soon. I started my career with the AIDS epidemic and that's what I've done most of my career is uh, taking care of patients with HIV and AIDS. And I seem to be ending my career with another epidemic. Um, so thank you, Meredith. Um, do you wanna talk about your background? <laughs> Certainly. So, um... 
Well, gosh, where do I start? Um, I'm a marine biologist by academia standards, but I've been in public health now uh, close to 18 or 19 years. Um, and I've, I've served in a variety of different roles in public health. And about 10 years ago, I landed my dream job for the city of Northampton as the health director. We love that that was your dream job and we hope you stay. <laughs> <laughs> and I plan to retire from here just a lot sooner than I originally thought. <laughs> May I ask a point of clarification? If we are done with the discussion about a vaccine mandate, does that mean it will not be on future agendas for us? No. We, so it, 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 what does that mean? So I asked Attorney Seawald the that exact question, um, just in case you know um, we have to discuss this because a new variant evolves in the future or something else comes up. And he said, absolutely, we can put it on the agenda again. Whether we someone made a motion tonight and it didn't pass, or we didn't make a motion, either way, we could still put it on a future agenda. But as at this point in time, with the end of discussion, this is no longer an action item for us to be discussing at this time, unless we bring it up at a future time. Exactly. Any other comments or discussion? Hearing none. Um, thank you, Meredith. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you, board members. Um, um, would someone like to make a motion? Move, Move. to adjourn. Second. Any other comments? Hearing none, we'll put it to a vote. Uh, Suzanne? Uh, yes. Cynthia? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you all.